Good morning, everyone. Today's our first Sunday in September. It's the 14th Sunday of Pentecost, and it's Labor Day. So we remember all our laborers, especially our frontline workers who uh, have been so faithful and caring for us. Um, and we thank God for the beautiful weather that we're having in September. Can't believe that the year is nearly gone. It's flown by so quickly. So today we'll start our service with David with announcements. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you with us for our virtual service today. And we are pleased to be able to connect with you and appreciate your taking time to be with us. Uh, you will notice that uh, as I began, I was wearing my mask, uh, which is something that uh, we want to do. Uh, you'll have noticed uh, that new infections in BC can, are continuing at historic levels, uh, which is a concern to everyone. However, the majority of these cases are not creating new clusters of infections. So the request of Dr. Bonnie Henry for us to be kind, to be safe, and to be calm are still what we need to be doing on a daily basis. We also need to be keeping our circles of contact small. We need to wear masks when we are unable to assure physical distancing, especially indoors and in stores and in enclosed places. And we need to continue washing our hands regularly. The good news from this is that it will likely mean that our fall flu season will be much milder than normal because we are practicing these things which we haven't been practicing in the past. Uh, Martina and the parish council are looking to ways to connect virtually for spiritual contact and support. The cathedral in Kamloops is hosting their seasons of creation and you will see the web link for this uh, on the screen. And they're on Wednesdays uh, via Zoom. Uh, Having this available to all the people in the territory is a wonderful gift. Please check out the web link and if you want, register and join us these uh, sessions. This will likely be the first of many sessions that will bring us together in new ways uh, around uh, community and, and our faith. We want to thank those of you who continue to support this ministry through your tithes and donations. We appreciate your gifts to the church and also to our Soup Song ministry. Your continual support is allowing us to continue to find new ways to minister and to serve you and our community. And if you have a specific request or need, please contact us so that we may be able to respond and be with you in, in uh, appropriate ways. And with that, I'll turn it back to Martina. We'll have a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts for worship. Let this be a sacred time, Holy One, in which we let what has begun grow and transform us to recognize each person we meet as our neighbor. In your mercy and grace, show us your way again today. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. Creator God, we thank you for bringing us together today to worship and praise you for your love and mercy, and to ask your blessing. Give us grace to see your hand in the week that is past, and your purpose in the week to come, through Jesus Christ, who lives with you in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we will have our first reading. Our first reading is taken from the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, 
a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. And this is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, and all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you. And when no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people. To bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron. To execute on them the judgment decree. This is glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Accept our praise, God of justice, defender of the oppressed. Give us grace to join in your circle in your word, that the whole world may see your glory through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our second reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 to 14. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourselves. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day not in reverence and drunkenness, not in debauchery and lessness not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Thanks be to God. It's our gospel lesson. 
The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you and you have regained, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So in thinking about which passage to, to uh, speak about, um, the, the Romans one would have been the, the, the easier one or the, the one that most readily resonated for me, but I chose the Gospel one because it's the one that's going to stretch things a little. So the good news that you just heard, what I just read, included an invitation. Right now, as you are, you can be a part of something, specifically a member of the body of Christ. The tricky part is that the body of Christ community includes an awful lot of people who are every bit as difficult as we are. Welcome to the church, folks. A couple of chapters ago, Jesus told Peter he was the rock on whom the church would be built. And now, we're being introduced to the concept of church conflict. And to, just to remind you, a huge church in Matthew's day included, at the most, 50 members. Their gatherings were more like family reunions, maybe 20 to 30 people. The relationship between believers was that of a family. Now, there are two things we say about community. One, we all say we want it, and two, we usually have no idea how difficult it is to be a part of. The really difficult thing about community is that it's made up of people. And people can be difficult, challenging, selfish, and unreliable. And when you have a group of disparate people together, conflict is inevitable. St. Benedict said that Community is a school for souls in which we learn not just how to live, but also how to experience abundant life. Authentic community is hard to come by. It's work, but it's worth it. Because when you find it, it's like discovering a little bit of heaven on earth. It's like experiencing the reality of communion with God in your midst. And as Jesus promises, when you gather in this way, with honesty and integrity, integrity, even when it's hard, amazing things can happen. Because Jesus is with you, right there, in your very midst, forming and being formed by your communal sharing, the joys and the conflicts. Love requires that we address the inevitable conflicts that arise among us. It's not enough to sweep them under the rug and allow them to fester. Unaddressed conflicts can render a community unable to function, as God hopes. But neither is rejection our first instinct. Separation is not to be taken lightly, even if it proves necessary. In the words we've just heard, what if Matthew isn't simply setting up rules of engagement, but rather is trying to build authentic Christian community? What if the point is less about having a code of conduct to follow and more about regaining a brother or sister? 
And one of Matthew's major concern isn't actually settling disputes, but creating an environment where Christ's presence continues to bring forgiveness, healing, and joy. At each stage of this process, the goal is reconciliation. The primary purpose of the process is to restore the wayward one back into the family relationship. It's about reconciliation, which is about forgiveness. Relationships are of precious and enduring value in the church. When a relationship is broken, it is worth going back over and over to work toward reconciliation. We are to be so concerned about a breach in a relationship that we are willing to do whatever is possible to restore it. As followers of the Christ, we believe that Christ is reconciling the whole world and each of us to God and to one another. So when two people take their conflict as an opportunity to practice reconciliation, what they do in the church can stand as a visible sign of what we believe Christ is doing in the world. An outward and visible sign of a grace that we believe is happening in a broader and more mysterious way in the world. Church conflict as an opportunity to practice reconciliation can actually be sacramental. Relationships take work to maintain, and community is harder to create and nurture than we might imagine. Because going to someone with your concern or grievance is a lot harder than talking behind his or her back. Bringing others to listen closely to what is said takes a lot more courage than posting something on Facebook. And working out disputes as a community together can be really, really hard. Authentic community is hard, but also powerful and healing and a tremendous witness. It's a lot of work, but also worth it, always. Matthew's Jesus is concerned about the least ones, the vulnerable, the ones at the bottom of the power pyramid. Better to tie a millstone around your neck and jump in the ocean than cause a little one to stumble. Better to leave 99 sheep on the mountains than lose a little one. The point is not that the church or its leaders possess special authority or insight when dealing with disputes, but that whenever it does exercise authority, Church leaders must pay constant attention to the least powerful members of the community. Whenever and whatever we bind or loose, the church community is called to defend the interests of the least ones in our midst, as well as to create the space and conditions for forgiveness and restoration to flourish. The process Jesus describes resembles and has been a foundation for what we know in the present day as restorative justice. Restorative justice focuses less on punishment and more on the restoration of dignity and wholeness for both the conflicted parties and their communities. In Jesus' day, his was a mission that included sinners and tax collectors. Matthew himself who was a tax collector. In Matthew's day, the mission was specifically extended to Gentiles and all nations, as expressed in Jesus' closing farewell. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Verse 17, about treating an unrepentant sinner as a Gentile and a tax collector, is expanded upon beautifully by Eugene Peterson in The Message. He writes, if the sinning fellow believer still won't listen, tell the church. If you won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch. Confront him with the need for repentance and offer again God's forgiving love. Relate to him or her the way Jesus related to tax collectors and to Gentiles. Offer them a relationship of acceptance and forgiveness 
don't write them off. Don't write them off because when they belong to the gathering of the people of God, it makes them and us whole. Peterson's image doesn't deny the reality of sin or minimize the differences we have. He reminds us, though, that our core principle is unity based on God's love, not exclusion based on someone else's sin. Our exclusion excludes us, and our inclusion includes us all. A little story from the Desert Fathers. A brother at Skidus committed a fault. A council was called to which Abba Moses was invited, but he refused to go to it. Then the priest sent someone to say to him, Come, for everyone is waiting for you. So he got up and went. He took a leaking jug, filled it with water, and carried it with him. The others came up to meet him and said to him, What is this, Father? The old man said to them, My sins run out behind me, and I do not see them. And today I am coming to judge the errors of another. When they heard that, they said no more to the brother, but forgave him. There is so much that is challenging in our world just now, from hurricanes to displays of hate, from injustice to intolerance, from loneliness to alienation, that the world desperately needs us to be the body of Christ. And then we can remind each other that we have Jesus' promise that each and every time we try, he's there with us, instructing us in the way to love, urging us on, forgiving us, and sending us out to be instruments of reconciliation and peace. He accompanies us wherever we may go. So, what kind of community do we want to be? A safe, social, and somewhat superficial one? Or do we want something more meaningful or intimate, which is riskier and harder? Do we want a place that can encourage us and hold us accountable? Or are we looking for a place we can be honest about our hopes and fears, dreams and anxieties, especially in the midst of this pandemic? Do we want somewhere we can just blend in? Or are we looking for a place we can really make a difference? True community is the courage and the willingness to be with one another and bear with one another in all conditions. Big things to think about. Thanks be to God. And you'll find our affirmation of faith in the um, bulletin. So together we say, we believe in God, the creator and lover of the universe, and we respond to this God in love. We believe in Jesus the Christ, the embodiment of love and the Savior of all, and we respond to this God in love. We believe in the Holy Spirit, love's power poured out, and the presence of love within, and we respond to this God in love. We believe in the church, the community of love, and we believe in life renewed and eternal, love enjoyed and shared with God and creation forever. And again, we dedicate ourselves to this love and to the God who gives it. Amen. And our prayer. This is the prayers of people. Let us pray. O living God of past and future, we praise you for this present moment. We join together to pray for the church, the world, and all in need. O oh God, we pray for the church throughout the world, that our members, ministers, and ministries may be agents of your forgiveness and grace. We pray for our nation, our leaders, and all who labor to make this country free and a haven of blessing, justice, and peace. We pray for the world that you present in all lands and once again bring freedom and life for all your children. 
Lord, in your mercy, we know you hear our prayers. We pray for the sick, the suffering, and the fearful. May they be protected and healed by their difficulties and illnesses. We pray for those who have passed and those who mourn their passing. Holy One, we pray for the freedom and restoration, especially in Beirut. And we pray especially that you would be present, especially those working on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, we know you hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for work and for the many works you have given us to do. Hear our prayers and on and strengthen and us for the week ahead. We pray with those who work by day and those who work by night those who work near and those whose work carries them far away. We pray for those who in this uncertain time have no employment. We acknowledge and pray with all volunteers who work tirelessly to help, support, and encourage others, especially in these times. We pray all of this knowing that your labors on our behalf never cease, and that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Amen. Are you continuing our bulletin? Dear friends in Christ, with our hearts and minds, we worship the Holy One. Let us confess our sins. Together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may be delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful God, grant to your people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And as our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Holy One, increase in us the healing power of your love. Guide and direct us that we show and share your love and goodness with all we need, as we were taught through Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And our doxology together. Glory to God, whose power, power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And a blessing. May the Spirit of God heal our bodies and make them places of communion. May the breath of God heal our hearts and set them on fire for justice. And may the Spirit of God heal our nations and make all relations just. Amen. And our dismissal. Let us depart in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.